All right, 1 Kings chapter 13. I love this story. It's a great story in the Bible. And we actually just covered um, part of this a couple weeks ago when I was going over the fulfilled prophecies and found in the Bible because it starts off with a fulfilled prophecy. Let's start reading here again in verse number one where we just read. Bible reads, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Now, just to bring you up to speed real briefly, in, in all the chapters leading up to here, you know, we, we saw King David's reign end and Solomon's kingdom being established. Then we saw Solomon get into some sin and, and it was prophesied that he was going to end up losing, you know, the majority of the kingdom, but God was going to keep one for David, his father's sake. Rehoboam, his son, becomes king. Rehoboam, that's, that's when all this, you know, when the kingdom's rent away from the house of David. And uh, Jeroboam is prophesied to become the king of the other tribes of, of Israel. Jeroboam just becomes king at the end of the last chapter in chapter 12. And right away he's getting into sin. And he's worried he's going to lose the kingdom. So, and the reason why he thinks he's going to lose the kingdom is because he's thinking, well, everyone's going to go back to Jerusalem because that's where the temple of the Lord is. They're going to keep worshiping God and they're going to, their heart is going to go back to the house of David. And he says, when they keep going back to Jerusalem, you know, they're going to end up killing me because they're just going to have Rehoboam reign over the whole kingdom. That was his fear. That was his worry. And uh, as a result of that, he made these golden calves one at Dan and one at Bethel for them to go and worship. And, and he set up these feasts and he set up like all these various things so that he said, you don't need to go to Jerusalem anymore. You could just worship God here, right? Worship at these idols. And, and that way he was trying to prevent them from going back. And, you know, it was all out of fear. It was a really bad decision, but it was, it was a horrible sin because from that point on, I mean, the children of Israel in that, na that northern nation of Israel is just, just, goes down the wrong path for quite a long time. The vast majority of the kings are wicked. The people are wicked, just by and large. Uh, it, that is the, and, and he becomes kind of the standard for being a wicked king. As I mentioned last week, you know, when you're reading through all the books of the Kings and the Chronicles and they're talking about how evil a king was, they'll compare it to see, well, was he quite as wicked as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat? All the time, he's that standard of how wicked a king is. So, we're seeing now here in, in chapter 13, as we start off, he's right by this altar to burn incense unto this idol, unto this false god. And a man of God comes. And what's interesting about this whole story is that we never learn the name of the man of God. He's just referred to as the man of God, the man of God, the man of God. And I think even that alone, from th that's pretty unique in this story, we could learn quite a bit. For one, it doesn't matter what his name is. It doesn't matter what any of the names are because what matters is the message. What matters is the word of God. You could, you know, you could have any name. If you're preaching the word of God, that's what truly matters. But another thing I think is kind of interesting too is that there is a man of God. That God does use man. That, that God is you know, using men to preach his word and to deliver his message that while we're not like the Catholic Church or like some other religions that have a God-man, like that, that they are your mediator between God and man. God still uses man to preach his word. And there's, there's definitely a difference there, right? It's, it's not like, like I am, have some closer connection to God because I'm leading this church or anyone else does for that matter. But God does choose men to use and to deliver his message and to preach his word. And that's what we see here. We have a man of God. He comes out of Judah by the word of the Lord. God sends him unto Bethel. And Jeroboam is standing there. He's by the altar. He's ready to burn incense. Verse number two, the Bible says, And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord. Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. So, this is the message that he's delivering. As the man of God, he's crying out, which means, you know, when it says he cried against the altar, it means he's yelling out. He's, he's preaching with a loud voice. He's preaching a message that needs to be heard. People say, why do you, know, why do you Baptists always, you know, 
you have yelling and you're preaching and stuff like that because it's important because this is, you know, we're trying to preach God's word and deliver a message from God. And yeah, we're going to cry out sometimes so that everyone can hear that message and realize this is important. This is straight from the word of God. This is something that, that God wants you to know. So he cries out against, he cries out against this altar saying, altar, altar, you know, thus saith the Lord. They're not his words. He didn't come up with this. He didn't come up with this out of his own heart. God told him to say these things. And he prophesied, this is, and this is an amazing event, and I'm not going to cover all the details of this, because I did that when we went over the, the, the Bible prophecies that, um, that, it, that were fulfilled in the Bible. This is one of those, he names off that someone, a descendant of David, a future descendant of David, is going to be born, and he says, Josiah will be his name. And he says, He's going to burn on this altar that you're making, right? That you just made. He just created this altar. It's brand new. He says, they're going to be burning men's bones. So all these false prophets and the people who are burning incense in the high places and the people who have gone after these strange gods, you know what's going to happen when Josiah comes around? Their bones are going to be burnt on this altar that you just made. That was his prophecy. But what's interesting about that prophecy is that that came to pass some 400 years later. 400 years, and I mentioned this in, in my other sermon, but I mean, think about how long ago 400 years was. We're talking in the 1600s. So imagine someone in the 1600s calling someone out by name of the lineage and household of David, you know, of a specific person's descendants from that time, saying, here's his name, here's what he's going to do, and it came to pass exactly as promised. And what's really interesting about that is that when Josiah was born, people weren't even reading the Bible. So when he was named Josiah, it wasn't like his parents were saying, here's going to be the guy that fulfills this prophecy from 400 years earlier right. at all. Right. Because it wasn't until he decided to repair the house of the Lord because his father had turned from the Lord and had been worshiping false gods. He's the one that's saying, you know what? No, we're going to worship the Lord. You know, that, that's who we're going to worship. They repair the house of the Lord and they're like, hey, we, f we found this book in there. Look, look at this. You know, it's, it's the law of the Lord. And then he gets all scared when they find out, wow, we've been sinning like crazy. We need to see what's going on. So when he was born and named Josiah and came and did all this stuff, it was not planned. This was not premeditated. Okay, he ne we need to fulfill this, this prophecy from 400 years earlier. No, it happened because God knows everything. And, and, and he knew in advance when he told this man of God to prophesy against it that that was going to happen. He already knew in advance. And of course, that's what plays out. And, and that, that in itself is an amazing event. But let's keep going out because I, I could go on and on about that. In fact, I did a couple weeks ago. Let's see verse number three here. We're in 1 Kings 13, verse number three. And he gave a sign the same day. So he's still preaching against his altar and he, and he's, he says something else here. Verse number three saying, this is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. Rent means it's going to be broken. Okay, this is going to be broken. It's going to break. And the ashes that are on it are going to be poured out. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar saying, lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him. Think about that. I mean, there's so many things that are amazing about this story. So King Jeroboam saying, you know, like, seize him, right? Arrest that guy right there. And, and he's pointing to him. And as he does that, his whole arm and his hand, just, it just gets, like, just stuck. He can't bend it, can't move it. It's just frozen in place. And it says in verse 5, the altar also was rent and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the words of the Lord. So this, this second, the first sign that he gives when he's preaching against it, that happens 400 years later. But to confirm what he's saying is from God right here, right now, this second part of his prophecy happens immediately. He says, that altar is going to be burnt, it's going to be rent and all the ashes are going to pour out. And then, like right after he says it, what happens? The altar breaks and all the ashes pour out. I mean, think about how crazy it is because that's a, that's a new altar. Jeroboam just made that thing. It's not like it's been sitting there for hundreds of years and then it just finally cracks and, and breaks because it's been weathered. It breaks immediately. Why? Because 
he's preaching and has the power of God and, um, and God's the one that causes these things to happen. So look at verse number six. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God and pray for me that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord and the king's hand was restored him again and became as it was before. So it's funny how scared you know, all of a sudden he's just like, uh, and think about if that happened to you. you he, the, Jeroboam's full of pride. He builds these false, you know, these, these idols, these graven images. Now his hand's stuck. And it's not, I mean, that's not something that's in his head. He can't do anything about it. And he's like, uh, you know, he just told him to arrest this guy. And now he's like entreating him, right? Now he's saying, C can you please tell God to, to give me my hand back to, so I could, I could be healed of this, of this problem? And that reminds me exactly like Pharaoh. Remember when, when Moses was going to Pharaoh and he's, he's, bringing, you know, he's preaching the word of God unto Pharaoh and saying, you know, let my people go. And he's if you don't do it, here's what's going to happen. There's going to be this plague. And every time after the plagues come, Pharaoh's just, he's all haughty. He's puffed up. He's prideful, like whatever, who's the Lord? And then the plague comes and all of a sudden Pharaoh's like, uh, okay, can you, can you please tell God to, to make this stop, you know, to make this quit? And this is, a, this is the kind of a pattern that we see in many people's lives. You know, it's easy to get lifted up with pride to say, who is God? I don't need God. I don't need anyone. You know, I've done all this myself, but God's got a good way of bringing people real low. And it's funny how everybody that gets brought down low pretty much is going to now all of a sudden be looking for God. But what we see here between we have Jeroboam and Pharaoh as bad examples because what happens as soon as the problem passes, they're right back to being proud again. They're right back to not learning anything from their lesson. They're right back to just not caring about God. The point of these things happening is that hopefully your heart can get right with God, not just in the moment, but beyond that moment and forever. Right? When these things happen, the goal that God wants to see is that when he has to bring you down and maybe you know, abase you because you've gotten too lifted up with yourself, is that you can be humble and stay humble even when God does bless you again or give you more or, or the problem subsides. But we see Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, as well as Pharaoh, both hardening their hearts and stiffening their neck and still continuing not to want to have anything to do with that. Would to God more people can wisen up a little bit when, uh, when these bad events happen and not go back to cursing God. Let's keep reading here. Verse number six. Or excuse me, verse number seven. And the king said unto the man of God, come home with me and refresh thyself and I will give thee a reward. So now, he's gone from being angry with him because he's calling out his idolatry and wanting to arrest him. Now that he was actually able to heal him, he's saying, hey, Come back with me. Come back to my house. He said, you know, I'm going to feed you a nice meal and I'm going to give you a reward. Now, Jeroboam's heart was not fixed at this point. We're going to see at the end of the chapter that he's basically has a hard heart still. But what this is a picture of is this temptation because what the man of God was told, and we'll get to that in just a minute, he was told not to go back he says, God says, here's, it was real specific instructions that was given to the man of God. He says, you go in to Bethel. You preach the message that I have for you to preach. You leave Bethel and you don't turn back. You don't stop to eat. You don't stop to drink. You get out of there. And that's what he was told. That was, that was the instructions for the man of God to follow. And he knows that. So when Jeroboam comes to him and says, hey, come home with me, refresh yourself, we'll grab a, you know, I'll feed you, you know, from the king's table, this nice food, and I'll give you a reward. He's got to answer no. He say no, and, and that's what he does do. But what I think Jeroboam pictures here is Satan. I think he's picture is the way that Satan tries to deceive you. He tries to get you to be tempted with breaking the word of the Lord, disobeying God's commandments, doing something that, that is a sin that's against what God told you to do or told you not to do, and try to make it appealing, try to, try to make it sound real good, try, to, try to, to say, hey, come and do this. Yeah, disobey the Lord and come back 
and I'll give you a reward, right? Try to, try to flash something in front of your eyes to get you to disobey God. Promising a reward, you know, to, get, to disobey God in sin. This reminded me of, of when Jesus was tempted of the devil in the wilderness. You don't have to turn there, but in Luke 4, verse 5, the Bible says, And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee in the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt will worship me, all shall be thine. That's what Satan's pitch unto Jesus Christ, saying, all these kingdoms, all this glory, all this wealth, I'll give it to you. I'll give you this reward if you just disobey God's commandments and worship me. And of course, Jesus answered, says Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. He answers Satan with the word of God. And this is exactly what the, the, the man of God does, is he says, no, I can't go with you because God said not to. It's the exact same response. We need to learn to get that response because sometimes these temptations can be alluring. Sometimes you get caught up thinking, you know, you, your mind focused on the wrong thing. You know, someone flashes a little bit of money in front of your face and you go, oh, wow. And all of a sudden, your integrity goes out the window. All of a sudden, God's word goes out the window, and you get, you get caught up in that trap, in that snare. I mean, when we try to, to, to trap an animal, what do you do? You're putting some bait out there. You're putting some, you know, you go out fishing. You, put, you don't just have a hook. You put something that the fish wants to eat on that hook, right? You're trying to lure them in. You put the, the meat on the, the bear trap to get the bear. You're putting whatever out there that is alluring to them. But it's a snare, it's a trap, you know, it's, there, it's not there for their better, it's there for, to, to, to get them, to, to capture them. And that's what Satan tries to do, to do with sin. He tries to capture us, he tries to, to allure us into his trap to destroy us. And we need to make sure that the word of God is settled in our heart so that we're not going to be so easily deceived and tempted by these things when they come up because they will come up uh, another example turn if you would real quick to proverbs chapter 7 there's another illustration of how this happens keep your finger in first kings 13 we're coming back to that i gave you the example of jesus christ and satan i think that that matches up fairly closely with what we're reading here with the man of god being promised a reward in order just to disobey the word of god Proverbs chapter 7, verse number 14. We're going to start reading. We're going to read about the adulterous woman. Right? Another, another example of someone trying to allure and appeal to the flesh to get you to sin. Verse number 14, she starts saying, you know, she's, she's conversing with this guy. I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Trying to be all spiritual, saying how godly she is. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. So she's saying all these things that are, you know, to get this mental image. Think about how nice my bed is. And there's, there's all these sweet scents and, and everything's so nice. And I came looking just for you. Verse 18, come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. Of course, she doesn't say, come, let's go commit adultery. Come, let's go commit fornication. She says, no, it's love. Come, let's, let's, let's just experience love. And that's what the world's going to tell you today. Fornication. No, it's not fornication. It's love. God's word says it's fornication. And it's a wicked sin. And adultery is even worse. No, let's, let's solace ourselves with loves. Verse 19, For the good man is not at home. He has gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. It's a trap. It's a snare. Trying to allure to the lust of the flesh. Go back, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 13. Alluring to the lust of the flesh, offering you this reward, offering you this, this, this great experience, trying to get you to disobey God and get into sin. This is what we see Jeroboam trying to do with the man of God. 
Let's see how he answers him because we, we know how he does, but let's read it here. Verse number 8, 1 Kings 13. Verse number 8, And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place, for so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Would to God we could all have this determination and steadfastness to remain in the will of God, to be just so focused on keeping God's word that we're not going to let these people deceive us. And who better? I mean, that's a pretty influential figure. Jeroboam was the king of Israel. I mean, the king saying to you, come with me. He probably would have had the best meal he's ever had in his life by going to the king's house. He has to tell the king, no, someone who's already has the most authority in the land. Oh, he's the king. He's the king over everybody. So he's got a lot of, of obstacles, if you will, to face, a lot of reasons to back down, a lot, of, a lot of reasons to buckle. But he stays firm. He stays strong, and he does what's right, and he says, no, I ought to obey God rather than man. And this is the attitude that we need to have. So far, so good. The man of God's doing great. He stood up to one test, and he, and he passed. Look at verse number 11. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king. Then they told also to their father. So this old prophet gets wind of what's been going on, what happened out there. Now we get, you know, and we're introduced to this man. Some, I, really, I think, you know, I read this and it's like, this is just some old washed up prophet, right? Why wasn't this prophet out there saying, Jeroboam, you're wicked. What are you doing building up these altars unto, unto these idols and unto these false gods? What's he doing? He's hanging out at home. This is one of the problems we still have today. There's way too many pastors and preachers that are not willing to stand up and say, thus saith the Lord, that, you know, adultery is an abomination that's worthy of the death penalty according to the Bible, that, homo, that sodomy and homosexuality is an abomination according to God and it ought not to be done. Where are these people standing up and just saying, no, we're not going to tolerate this. We're not going to become tolerant. We're not going to be accepting of sin and wickedness. Amen. We need way more people going out and, and, and standing up against this. But you got the old prophets. They don't want to step on anyone's toes. The old prophets want to tell everyone everything's just fine. They, they're afraid of getting attacked. They're afraid of what the king might say. They're afraid of whatever. Afraid of their own shadow. Yeah. And that's how you know they don't got the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God gives you boldness. I'm not saying they're not saved, but they don't have the power of the Holy Spirit on them if you're not preaching boldly. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 12. We're going to read a little bit more about this old washed up prophet. Verse number 12. And their father said unto them, what, what way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his son, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Now, my first thing is, why was he, what was he doing sitting under the oak? Now, was it a sin for him to stop and sit under the oak? No. Was he disobedient to God's word by stopping and sitting under the oak? No. But the word of the Lord that came unto him, he said in verse 9, he says, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So if you are not even allowed to eat bread and drink water in that place, I want to be getting out of there, right? I want to be getting a drink of water because he's traveling. It's not like he's getting in his car and driving away. Right? Traveling then is going to make you a little bit more thirsty than these. Even if he's on an ass, even if he's on a horse or whatever, however, you know, his, his mode of transportation, you're still going to get thirsty traveling out in the sun. And I'm saying, why are you stopping for a break under the tree? Just get out of there so you could have yourself, you know, some refreshments and, and, and get back to, to regular life. I mean, it, it was a, a serious warning from the Word of God. And I think that could have saved him all of this trouble and all this hassle had he would have just... Ugh, just push it out a little bit more and just, just kind of gone the rest of the way and completed his mission 100%. We need to be careful about these things that, yeah, you can say, you know what, they're not sins, but it might just lead you in the wrong direction. You might end up putting yourself in a place 
where, where you're going to end up being tempted to sin or, you know, where, where bad things might be more prone to happen. We need to have this type of wisdom and make sure that when we're following the word of the Lord, we are following it not just, well, this is what I got to do and, and doing the minimum, right? Just, just barely covering to make sure I don't sin. But being excited about the word, hey, this is the word of God, man. Let's do this. Let's do it with zeal. Let's be excited about it and, and, and put in 110%. You have that type of an attitude, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be finding yourself in these situations nearly as frequently where you're getting all these, uh, these temptations coming at you. But here he is, right? He, he was not, see, that didn't do anything wrong as far as sinning goes. He was, he was just fine. But I think we can learn that a little bit. Let's see, let's see what he says here. Verse 15. Then he said unto him, come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. He's got this in his head pretty good, what God told him. I mean, he's not, I mean, he didn't even mix up his words at all. He says the exact same thing. And this is what God told me to do. And he knows it. And you know what? Praise God. He returns the same answer to this old prophet that he did to Jeroboam. Amen. He's doing good. Still staying true to the word of God. It doesn't matter if... The, the king says it. It doesn't matter if this prophet says it. He's saying, you know what? This is the word of God. I'm not going to break it. But then this happens. Look at verse 18. So the old prophet answers him. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. Hey, I'm just like you. I'm a prophet. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, bring him back with thee into thine house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. Now we have this lying old prophet saying, hey, God told me that God said, no, no, no. I know God told you that, but see, God told me that it's actually okay and that he wants you to eat bread and he wants you to drink water, completely contradicting what God had actually told him. My first thought is like, what a jerk. I mean, this guy's, he's already been told no. And the reason why he was told no is because God said not to do it. But it shows you how much respect this old prophet had for the word of God. Zero. Which is why he wasn't out there rebuking Jeroboam. Because it doesn't matter to him. After hearing for himself the word of God, this guy still lies unto the man. And this also shows you that the people that will try to cause you to sin and they'll try to, to, to allure you and tempt you is not always going to be as easy to spot as Jeroboam is. Jeroboam was doing everything public. I mean, he's just rearing up these altars on the false gods. You know, anyone that has, that has half a brain in the word of God can see this is wicked, right? I mean, this is just overt, out in the open. He's making idols. The, you know, the first and second commandments say not to make idols, not to worship them, not to do any of that stuff. It doesn't take a, a, you know, a theologian to figure this stuff out. Anybody can see that plainly. So when you see the Jeroboam trying to tempt you, trying to allure you, that's a little bit easier to discern and say, you know what, I'm not going to follow this guy. But when you got someone that says, hey, I'm a prophet. I'm a man of God too. And guess what? God told me this. Now that becomes a little bit more deceptive, a little bit more tricky, and we need to make sure that we are um, aware of this, obviously, aware of false prophets, aware of that these things are going to happen, and still stand by the word of God, regardless of who is trying to tempt you, regardless of who it is that's telling you, no, actually you should do this, even though God's word says that. I don't care if it's me. I don't care if it's your favorite pastor from, from any other church, someone that you respect, someone that you look up to. If someone's telling you, no, I know the Bible says this, but you should do that. You need to go with God's word every single time. Amen. I don't care who the person is. We're not supposed to be respecter of persons anyways. And like I said at the beginning, the man of God, his name doesn't matter. It's the message. It's the word of God that matters. And we need to make sure that we don't fall into a cult of personality of following some one man or one teacher and just following him wherever he goes without uh, analyzing it against the word of God. 
and testing it and judging it against Scripture. Because that's when you fall into a cult. When I was thinking about this, I was thinking about, you know, what comes to mind is Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 verses 8 and 9 says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. That was the Apostle Paul to the church of Galatia. And he said, though we, so like we are, he's including himself. He says, if me or Timothy or Titus or Barnabas or any of us preach another gospel unto you, or even an angel of God, I don't care if you see a heavenly vision, if they preach you some other gospel than what you've already received, let them be accursed. He's including himself in that. Why? Because any other gospel is going to be a false gospel. And it's not going to be from God. So whether it's coming from a man who you already know, oh man, this is a great man of God, but he's teaching you a false gospel, let him be accursed. You claim to have these revelations from heaven. An angel of God told me this. Let him be accursed. This is how we know that the Mormons are wrong. The Mormon, Joseph Smith is the one that claimed to have a heavenly vision. An angel appeared unto him and he gave him this, this new teaching and, and he gave him the golden tablets and, and, and he taught him how to, he gave him the special glasses to be able to read it and he came up with a false gospel. That's how we know he's a fraud. He's got a false gospel. He's got another gospel. I don't care if Joseph Smith really did see an angel, which would be a devil giving him this vision and giving him this insight, he's preaching a false gospel, let him be accursed. This is how we know the JWs are wrong. Charles Taze Russell is a false prophet, made all kinds of false predictions and false claims that weren't of God, trying to speak in the name of the Lord, and his prophecies didn't come to pass. He's a false prophet, he's a phony. This is how we know that the, the Seventh-day Adventists also are wrong. Ellen G. White was a false prophetess with a false gospel, having false prophecies that didn't come to pass because they weren't of God. They weren't preaching the word of the Lord. They, they are tested and failed. Let them be accursed. Amen. And we need to make sure that we don't get sucked in to the people, that it could be real charismatic, that could be real good speakers, really good orders, really good at, at tugging at your heartstrings, really good at using their words to, to be, you know, to, to, to kind of manipulate you or control you. Someone is a good speaker that claim to have a word from the Lord that's not already written in the Bible. This is a common thing these days, especially in a lot of the bigger churches, the mega churches. I was down in Phoenix and there, you know, I was, I was attending a funeral for someone that had gone to one of these mega churches and I was hearing the pastor preach uh, on the service and in the middle of the funeral, he's talking to, to the, one, the man's child that, that had, the man had died and, you know, he had a couple of younger children and he goes, he goes, God told me to tell you this. I got a word from God last night and this is what he told me to tell you and you know what? It wasn't anything that's found in the Bible. Now, I'll tell you what, we got word of God. When, we got, when someone says, hey, I, I'm hearing and God's telling me this is exactly what you want to do, we got to write that down because that's scripture. That's, that's not the word of God. That's coming out of his own heart. Now, regardless of if he's saying something that's not bad, okay, and he didn't. He didn't tell his kid anything bad. He didn't tell him to go build an altar or any, you know, worship some idol. But don't claim God's word on something that's not God's word. God has integrity. When God says something, it's going to come to pass for sure. No doubt about it. And don't be going around and throwing God's name around and saying, this is what God said. Unless it's already written here. Because I'll tell you what, God has given us his word. Amen. It's complete. God uses man, yes. He uses man to preach his word, but we have his words. We don't need anything else. Watch out for those people. In this case, with the man of God, he should have spotted the fraud. 
from the old prophet. First, it was coming from someone he didn't even know. He didn't know who this old prophet was. Why should he have any respect on him? But, but even more importantly, it contradicted what he was already told. When you know something to be God's word, let's say you know the Ten Commandments. Real simple, right? So many people know that. I know what the Ten Commandments say. I know, what they I, know I shouldn't steal. But then you get someone trying to convince you that, well, stealing's okay in this situation. Stealing's okay in that situation. You don't have, I, mean, I don't care if it's a pastor telling you that. You tell him no. It's not okay. Because God's word said so. If you're going to tell me something that contradicts what the Bible says, you're wrong. And we need to make sure we don't fall into that trap and that we can test it and spot these frauds. This old prophet was a fraud. He should have been able to tell that. Uh, look at 1 Kings 13. Let's keep going here in the chapter. So this guy lies to him and he deceives him. He tricks him and he falls for it. Verse number 19, so he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. He did exactly the things that God told him not to do. Look what happens, verse 20. And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. So now he actually is receiving the word of the Lord. Before he lied about what God said, now he actually is getting the word of the Lord. Verse 21, it says, And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water, thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. And it came to pass, after he had eaten bread, and after he had drunk, that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. Think about what just happened here. He disobeyed God's word. The very prophet that lied unto him now said, okay, because you disobeyed my commandment, now you're going to die. And that's exactly what happens. As soon as he leaves, lion meets him, lion kills him. There are so many things that we could learn from this one event that happened. First of all, it gives us a little bit of an insight into God's character. And this is something, unfortunately, that's not taught often enough. We were just out soul winning today, Brother Sebastian and I, and we talked to this lady, real nice lady. And um, I, I forget how we got on the subject, but I, she said something about, about the preaching. I think at a Mormon church that she was going to. And, uh, and, I, and she said something about hellfire and brimstone. And I was like, well, we do preach hellfire and brimstone, right? I mean, that is what we preach here. And she was kind of like, oh, like, and, and I was trying to explain why. Why do we preach that? Because it's not just for, for no reason. It's not just to, to be jerks. It's not just to try to make people feel bad necessarily. But, um, you know, there's a good reason for it. What I, what I was telling her is that the reason why we preach that way is because we're trying to preach the whole Bible. We're trying to follow the example of Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel. We're trying to follow the example of Jesus Christ, who's, you know, when he was preaching in Matthew 23 against the Pharisees, saying, you know, how shall you, you, know, how, how shall you escape the damnation of hell, you vipers and you serpents? And these are things that we find throughout the Bible, and we don't want to have an imbalanced view of who God is. We know that God is love, and we love him for that, and we preach on that, and, and it's comforting, and it's edifying. We know that God is long-suffering, and praise God for his mercy that endureth forever. We find that throughout the Bible, and we're going to extol that, and we're going to preach on that, and we love that, but that's not the only thing we're going to preach. We have to get the full perspective. We have to get the full view. If we want to understand who God is, we have to understand all facets of God, because there's also this aspect of God that killed somebody for not obeying his word. Took his life from him like that. And this isn't an isolated incident. You think of Uzzah, when they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant back from the Philistines. And what did they do? They put it on a cart. That's not what God told them to do. He told them to carry it on their shoulders. They put it on a cart because that's what the Philistines did. So they're learning from the world. They're learning from the heathen how they could transport this easier. They hit a bump. 
the thing's about ready to tip over. And Uzzah goes, wow, the Ark of the Covenant, well, we, this, is, this is sacred. We need to protect this thing. He puts out his hand to stop it from falling. God strikes him dead. Sons of Aaron offered up strange incense. They're saying, wow, yo, God said, this is the incense I want you to burn unto me. You offer this. This is the way you make it. This is the way you do it. And this is what I want. But they had a better idea. They said, you know what? I don't like the way that this incense smells. I think we're going to do it a little bit different. God's going to like this. We've got something for him. You know, we're doing the work for God. We're doing service for God. We'll offer him this and see what God thinks about that. Dead. You say, oh, that's how God was in the Old Testament, but he's way different in the New Testament. Really? Do you ever read Acts chapter 5? Acts chapter 5, the, new, the, 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 the church, right? The church age. This is when... You got people coming to church. You got the apostles. All kinds of great things are happening. You've got people getting saved. You got people being baptized. You got this church growing. Thousands of people getting saved. And they got everyone coming together. And, and they're trying to, you know, people are donating all kinds of stuff to, to further the service of God so they can have all things coming. Acts chapter 5, verse number 1 says, But a certain man named Ananias, Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart that thou, thou hast not lied unto men but unto God? And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. He died. Why did he die? Because he told a lie. And it wasn't because he lied unto men, but he lied unto God. You say, what's the big deal? He was still offering up all kinds of money and stuff for the church. Yeah, so he, he lied about how much he was giving, right? That's not the attitude we want to have with God. I think what we could learn from God is that we ought to have a healthy fear of God and not just treat his commandments as suggestions. When he says not to bear a false witness, let's take that seriously. When he says, don't go back and have a meal, don't go back and have the meal. What's so hard to understand about that? You say, oh, what's he, how mad can he get, right? I mean, all I did was I listened to this prophet and ate a meal. I mean, you really have to kill me for that? Well, I'll tell you what, that's, who, that's part of who God is. We need to have a healthy respect and fear of God. This is in the Bible for a reason. I'm not making this stuff up. Unfortunately, people aren't hearing this aspect about God because it's not, it doesn't make you comfortable. You say, well, I thought God is love. He is love. Amen and amen. He provided a Savior for us that we don't deserve. He absolutely is love. He absolutely offers forgiveness. But you know what? He also is a judge and he also has a law. And he's also the lawgiver. And he also expects and commands us to, to behave a certain way and, and to respect him. And when he says something, that we ought to listen to it. It's another part of who God is. So we, the reason why we do the, fire, the hell, fire, and damnation preaching is, one, we need a healthy fear of God. We need to know that, that he's not playing around. They're not suggestions. They're commandments. Another thing this teaches us though here in this story is that God will hold you accountable for sinning even when you're deceived. Because what happened here? Now, this man of God would not have just gone back on his own and, and had a meal, right? Even after Jeroboam invited him, he said no. And even when this guy invited him, he said no until he said, oh, well, God said it's okay. That's what he was relying on. And you can say, well, why is that such a big deal? I mean, he tricked him because he lied unto him, right? That's, that's not as bad. Well, God still holds you accountable for sinning even when other people deceive you. It's important to recognize that. And the more we realize that, the more you ought to have a fire under your butt to make sure that you know what this book says for yourself and not rely on someone else, on some old prophet to teach you what this book says you need to understand it for yourself because God's going to hold you responsible. Now, shame on this old prophet for, for lying to him. You know what? He's going to have to pay for that too. But shame on you for not knowing what the book says. 
If I'm up here lying to you tonight, or any day for that matter, shame on me for that, but you know what? You ought to be able to judge what I'm preaching you based on God's word. And you can't go and blame, you know, blame this person, like, you know, say, well, God, you know, Pastor Burson said this, so you know, I'm kind of not responsible for all these sins I've gotten into. Yes, you are. We're all guilty. We're all held responsible for our own sins. Think about Adam and Eve is a perfect example of that, right? Adam and Eve both knew they're not supposed to eat of that of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They knew that that's the forbidden tree. Eve repeated that unto Satan when, when the serpent approached her in the garden. No, no, we, you know, we could eat of all these trees, but not that one. And what did he do? He deceived her. He alluded to her. He lied to her. First, he questioned God's word, yea, if God said. And then he said, well, God knows the day that you eat thereof, you'll be like God's. You shall not surely die. And he lied to her. He deceived her. But God cursed her anyways because she already was given the word of God and should have known better. And she was punished just like Adam was. Just like, you know, and the serpent, they're all punished for getting involved in that sin. And we can't use an excuse even of being deceived with God. It's not a valid excuse. Right. We also know that sinning through ignorance is also, we're also responsible for that. Not only if you're deceived, but even if you're ignorant of something. Even if you just don't know. Um, I'm not going to go back and read all this, but in Leviticus chapter 4, if you're interested, the whole chapter, Leviticus chapter 4, talks about, in God's law, when people are guilty of sinning through ignorance, what the proper uh, sacrifices are that they need to make in order to atone for their sins. So, what that teaches is that, you know what, when you sin through ignorance, you're still, you're still sinning. And you're still responsible for what you've done. Now, you ought to get right with God. If you, if you sin through ignorance, say, what do I do if I've sinned through ignorance? Because we don't have these Old Testament laws you know, and, and, and um, you know, sacrifices to make. Because Jesus Christ is a sacrifice once from the foundation of the world for us. Well, when you find out about it, you ought to confess and forsake your sins. You ought to just repent, get right with God by confessing to God. You know what, God? I didn't realize all these years what we're doing is a sin. Just like King Josiah. I mentioned him earlier in the, in the sermon. When he realized, oh, wow, this is what the Bible actually says? What did he do? Did he say, well, I didn't know. Oh, well, whatever. No, he said, we need to, to, to you know, get all to God, tell God we're sorry that all these things have been happening. I didn't know this stuff, God, but we're going to do what's right now. And that's the attitude that we need to have, whether you're deceived or whether it's through ignorance, to have the attitude when you realize what you did was wrong, to get on your knees, confess it to God, forsake it, and, and do what's right from that time forward. And, and you know what? God will uh, show his, and that's where God's mercy and, and his long suffering and everything comes into play is when you could humble yourself and get right with him. Let's keep going here in 1 Kings chapter 13. Verse number 25. 1 Kings 13, 25. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass in the way and the lion standing by the carcass. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when, the, and when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who is disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion, which hath torn him and slain him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. And he spake to his sons, saying, Saddle me the ass. And they saddled him. And he went and found his carcass cast in the way, and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass, the lion had not eaten the carcass nor torn the ass. And it, it's making this point of saying that in the Bible. It's not by accident because this is undoubtedly God's judgment coming upon the man of God. It's not some random lion attack where the lion's real hungry and he needs a meal, so he's going to kill this guy to eat him. That's why it says, just point black, because why? there's no other reason why a lion's just going to go and kill a man and just stand there. That's not normal behavior for lions to just do that. If the lion's going to attack and hunt, he's going he's to be eating the lion, eating the ass, you know, whatever it is. That would be the whole purpose for him attacking. But he didn't do that. He just killed the man and he stood there. He's like, okay. 
So then this old, when the old prophet comes back, he, he sees this scene, and we definitely see this is, this is, without a doubt, God's judgment that had come upon him. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 29, And the prophet took up the carcass of the man of God, laid it upon his ass, and brought it back. And the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid his carcass in his own grave, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. Yeah, now you're real sad after you just lied to him and caused this guy to die. Verse 31, And it came to pass after he had buried him that he spake to his son, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the sepulcher wherein the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. This guy knew that everything that the man of God preached would come to pass, which is why he's saying he wanted to make sure his bones were not dug up and burnt on the altar. Because remember, that was a prophecy that he gave. When Josiah comes around, he's going to burn the bones of those people that were offering up in the high places, which tells you that, you know what, that old prophet was probably offering sacrifices up in the high places. Because those were the people's bones that were going to be dug up and burned on that altar. So he's like, I believe him. These things are definitely going to come to pass. So put my bones with his bones. Because he was a man of God. And, that, you know, and that's exactly what happens when, um, when you read uh, the, the, about King Josiah when he goes back and he actually fulfills that prophecy. He leaves the man of God's bones alone. He says, and what, you know, what's this marker say? Who's this? Well, that was the man of God that prophesied all these things that you're doing right now. He says, okay, leave that guy alone. And everyone else got dug up and burned on that altar. So even this old prophet was able to recognize, you know what, this is, this is the word of God. And that's why he said, you know what, bury me with him. I want my bones with his bones because I don't want my bones getting all burned up on that altar. Let's finish up here the chapter, verse number 33. After this thing, Jeroboam returned not from his evil way. Turned not from his evil way. His hand got withered up. He saw the, the sign. He saw the altar rent. He knew it was from God. He had already heard from God through the prophet that told him that he was going to be the king. All of these things happen. You know what? For some people, it just doesn't matter how much they see because they have hardened their own heart. We see the same thing. You know, it's kind of mind-boggling when you think about the people in Jesus' day. It didn't matter how many miracles they'd seen with their own eyes. It didn't even matter when he raised Lazarus back up from the dead and they had no explanation for it. But they still chose, let's kill him. Some people, it don't matter how much they see. Because you know, a lot of people say, well, I can't see it. You expect me to take this on faith? You know, I can't see it with my own eyes. It doesn't matter. Right. It doesn't matter. You could see it with your own eyes. And that's still, you know, some people, it's never going to be enough. You tell them one thing, oh, but what do we go? And that's why I don't get too caught up. That's why the Bible says, you know, a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Because you can show these people that just want to say, oh, the Bible's wrong, it's full of errors. Okay, let's look at one. And then you show them and explain. You say, no, actually, it's not an error because, and you have a real good answer for you, answer completely. Oh, but what about this over here? Oh, but what about this over here? It doesn't matter because they've already hardened their heart and they don't care. Now, we give them the opportunity, right? We give them the first admonition. You give them the second admonition. But after that, forget it. God sent this man of God unto Jeroboam to try to get him right, to try to get him to repent, to try to get him to fix his error and to do what's right. But you know what we're not going to see after this? God dealing with Jeroboam anymore after this manner. It's fine. Fine. I'm done with you. You made up your mind. Too bad. Verse 33. After this thing, Jeroboam returned not from his evil way, but made again of the lowest of the people, priests of the high places. Whosoever he would, he consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. And this thing became sin unto the house of Jeroboam, even to cut it off and to destroy it from off the face of the earth. Jeroboam stiffens his neck against the word of God, and his whole household gets cut off as a result. He pays for it with his life and the life of his, of his seed, of his children, of his heirs. His whole house ends up getting cut off. God says, fine, I'm done with you. These are aspects of God that we need to, to, to have that healthy understanding of. 
that we could keep a humble heart, a humble attitude. When we see you, the Bible says something, that we treat it with respect because it's God's word. It's not a suggestion. It's not something that, you, that yeah, you know, I know it says all these various things. I know, I know Leviticus has all these rules and stuff, but, you know, it's 2017. It's just, it's just so old. I don't see why we have to follow that anymore. I mean, God, you know, God changes, right? With the times, isn't God hip with the times? The Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not. God doesn't change. His words are eternal. They're from everlasting and to everlasting. We need to treat it as such. Have respect under the word of God. Try not to get deceived by these false prophets out there and by, by Satan and anyone else who's going to try to, to allure you through the lust of your own flesh to, to go against the word of God. And let's all make sure we're responsible for knowing what's in this book on our own by reading through it regularly to make sure that no one can deceive you because you've got the word of God in your heart and in your hand. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this great story in the Bible. God, I pray that you would please help us all to not go away tonight as forgetful hearers, but that we could glean these, these great truths from your word and apply them into our life. Dear God, help us to be vigilant and steadfast and, and trusting and believing in your word and to not allow anyone to sway us from your words, dear God, that we could keep them in our heart that we could uh, spot the, the false prophets from a mile away and just stand fast in your word, dear God. Pray that you please bless everyone here tonight and help us all to, to grow closer to you, to know more about you, dear God, and to become more conformed under the image of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen.